Hi, this is Diana from DivineFractal.com, and today I would like to get you updated on the New Zealand whale beaching that recently happened. Some more details have come to light. Then I would like to discuss with you some commonly held beliefs on why whales beach. And then I'd like to show you a theory that I found that may just well be the explanation for what's going on. And at the end, let's extrapolate. Let's speculate a little farther. So first of all, it was travel blogger Liz Carlson. Her and her friend Julian were hiking on Stewart Island, part of New Zealand, and they were out in a very remote area when they happened upon the scene of more than 100 pilot wells that had become beached. She says, it was one of those jaw-dropping moments. We came to the beach around sunset and spotted something in the shallows. When we realized it was whales, we dropped everything and ran to the surf. We'd seen whales in the wild before, but nothing can prepare you for this. It was horrific. The two immediately tried to find some way to help to push the whales back deeper into the water. But you quickly realize there's nothing you can do. They're just too big. The futility was the worst, she said. They're crying out to each other and talking and clicking, and there's no way to help them. Unable to do anything themselves, they frantically thought of ways to help. Stewart Island is a very remote island off the coast of New Zealand's South Island, and the beach they were hiking on is even more remote. The pair hadn't seen any other hikers for the past two days, and they knew it was nine miles away before they could get to conservation workers. With no mobile phone reception, they hoped there might be a radio in the hut, and so her friend Julian headed out to get help. She says, my heart completely broke. Left by herself with scores of dying whales on the vast beach. I'll never forget their cries, the way they watched me as I sat with them in the water, how they desperately tried to swim, but their weight only dug them deeper into the sand. My heart completely broke. The 30 year old spotted a young baby whale and tried to get it into the water. While the adult whales were impossible to move at all, she did manage to move one of the young ones. It took everything I had to get the baby into the water, and then he just kept rebeaching himself. You can sense the fear in the animals, she said. They're looking at you. They watch you, and they have very human-like eyes. Over the next few hours, there was little that she could do except wait. I knew they would inevitably die. I sank to my knees in the sand, screaming in frustration and crying with the sound of dozens of dying whales behind me, utterly alone. A few hours later, Julian came back with a group of rangers. They were able to assess the situation, but at night it was clear there was nothing that could be done. At the time, most of the whales were still in the surf and the tide was still coming in. So Liz and Julian went to their campsite, hoping that maybe overnight the two whale pods would make it back to the ocean. The next morning, they woke to a situation even more dire. It was low tide and the whales were in the dry sand. Some had already died and the others were lying in the beach in pain. They had tears in their eyes. It looked like they were crying and they were making sad sounds. It was clear that none of the whales could be saved takes about five people to move one of the whales to the beach, and the island itself is so remote that there was no hope of bringing help in time. So the rangers had to make what they called the heartbreaking decision to euthanize the rest of the whales. The only alternative would have been to leave them to a slow and painful death over several days. So what causes whales to beach themselves? Um, when you look this up, you're going to find out a whole bunch of theories. Um, for example, um, this says the exact reasons why whales and dolphins become stranded are not fully understood. Contributing factors can include sickness, navigational error, geographical features, rapidly falling tide, being chased by a predator, extreme weather. Um, other theories that come up are genetic mutations, illnesses from infections or parasites, injuries from pred predators, entanglements in fishing gear, age. There's a whole bunch of reasons that come up. Um, and if you keep digging, what you run into is there's some evidence that sonar used by naval ships could impact whales' migration, driving them to shallow waters. So first of all, let me state for the record here that I fully support our military men and women and all of the hard work that they do. But I do think that as humans, we really need to be much more cognizant that we are not the only 
intelligent life on this planet. So, sonar. Um, in this article, it says some evidence of sonar. If you dig a little bit further, um, environmental groups have long argued that noise pollution in the ocean, sonar, particularly the military's use of sonar, has been responsible for a number of whale stranding incidents. After numerous beaching incidents that correlated with significant military sonar exercises, the U.S. Navy did conclude in 2001 that a small number of stranding incidents were related to the use of sonar. Over the following decade, several court battles resulted in a moderate amount of regulation. Most recently, a 2015 settlement between the U.S. Navy and the National Marine Fisheries Service agreed that certain marine areas be protected from training exercises that result in significant undersea noise pollution. And this still says, while the connection between some stranding incidents and human influence has been comfortably proven, it still only accounts for a certain amount of them. Well, when did we first start using sonar underwater? It turns out in the 1800s, all the way back in 1826 on Lake Geneva in Switzerland, John Daniel Holliden, a, phys a physicist, and Charles Francois Strum, a mathematician, made the first recorded attempt to determine the speed of sound in water. So basically what they did is one of them dropped a bell down in the water and the other one a measurement device and they shot a gun off so that they could see and time it. <sighs> so what's that like underwater if you're a whale? Well, Sonar systems, first developed by the U.S. Navy to detect en enemy submarines, generate slow rolling sound waves, topping out at around 235 decibels. The world's loudest rock bands top out at 130. That's right, the Navy is shooting 235 decibels, and a rock band tops out at 130. These sound waves can travel for hundreds of miles underwater and can retain an intensity of 140 decibels as far as 300 miles from the source. So, <laughs> what do we think? We think that sonar communication and navigation may make marine mammals deaf. So what did I find? Well, the whale beach theory. A valid well beach theory must explain all consistent observations and also connect both modern and ancient breachings to a common cause. Well, we already found some ancient breachings here, 1800s, right? When we started messing around with sonar. While scientists admit they don't know why whales mass strand, yet they've advanced 200 plus odd theories that even when combined into one still do not explain the consistent observations on the beach. They get around their obvious weaknesses. Scientists now claim there's little truth in all of their ideas. In other words, whales mass strand for more than 200 different reasons. That doesn't sound very scientific. Other reasons that top whale scientists toss around are psychological concepts, like perhaps they followed a sick pod member to the beach and then they got caught in the tide. This article says this is not science, it's comedy. Whale scientists also seem to be especially fearful of any new idea that might gain popularity and cause them great embarrassment. We call this the not invented here syndrome. As an example, suppose whales mass strand because of a pressure related injury in their cranial air spaces that might easily occur during a surprise encounter. Okay, so in other words, a sudden really, really loud noise. Now you can imagine if you use sonar as your way of getting around that you're gonna be sensitive to sounds and they're blasting sounds from sonar, tests, weapons, navigation at decibels that are louder than a rock concert. So what would you do? you would either ascend or descend suddenly to get away from it, most likely. So what are causes for that? Well, it's possible that seafloor earthquakes could cause really loud noises. It's possible that there could be underwater volcanic explosions that are really loud, um, a sudden collapse of a volcanic caudra, or shock waves generated when, uh, like say a meteor or something hits the water. And even here, none of those are actually talking about sonar that's being blasted. So let's think about these creatures that are highly intelligent, that live in the water. They're probably 
have a good sense for when there's something that's natural that's happening around them that they can avoid. But if they had, for example, sonar suddenly blasted, they wouldn't be able to get away from it. So this says that the cause turns out to be a barometric Barotraumatic in nature, the most common injury of all divers, would make scientists look like fools. Do they deserve it? After all, barotraumatic is indeed barotrauma is indeed the most common injury of all diving sea mammals, sea turtles, and birds, including humans. But whale scientists have never ever investigated barotrauma in the cranial air sinuses, the middle air pockets, or the massive air sacs that isolate and insulate. So Basically, a sonar blast and they dive quickly or they ascend quickly to get away from it, there is a very, very high likely chance that barotrauma in the cranial air sacs due to exposure to rapid and excessive changes in diving pressure are causing damage to them. Now, let's think about that. That actually makes complete sense because what's happening a lot of times when beaches when whales beach themselves, as people like in the article, Liz, try to take the whales back out to the water. But you can imagine if you already had your ability to sense your direction blown out, you you wouldn't be able to survive. They're probably beaching themselves so that they can continue to breathe because they do breathe air and then they would drown if they were just underwater. This says the whale stranding hypothesis presented here suggests that excessive low frequency pressure pulsations generated by all the above named sources, plus, here he's mentioning Navy sonar, explosives, and air guns, cause barosinitis in the cranial air spaces of diving whales that disables their echo navigation system. In other words, the cause of both ancient and modern beaches, beachings is rapid and excessive changes in ambient water pressure resulting in barosinitis in the cranial air spaces of pods of deep diving whales and dolphins. Basically because they serve an acoustic function, barosinitis in these air sacs and sinuses will indeed disable biosonar and cause whales to slim, swim blindly downstream. They'll swim with the flow because everything without a sense of direction either floats or swims in the path of least drag. The downstream current that guides whales to beaches is also the same energy that builds the beach in the first place. This is a valid whale beach hypothesis. It also agrees with what the great Nikolai Tessa said years ago. If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. All right. So, you know, I have to admit that I don't think I've ever been able to find any scientists talking about this potential or anybody even saying that they're studying it on actual beached whales. I'm sure it's out there somewhere, but I haven't seen it. And then definitely in the tons and of articles that I sifted through doing research, all I kept finding over and over again is, we don't know what causes it. We don't know what causes it. We don't know what causes it. All right, so let's extrapolate. Let's speculate. Let's throw a little conspiracy theory out there. Anybody remember Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home? I do. I remember a probe came to Earth in the future and it was trying to talk to us and eventually they realized, hey, they're speaking in whale song. But they in, in the movie, there weren't any more whales in the future. Uh, so they went back in time to get a whale to be able to communicate with the probe. So that got me thinking, you know, I've thought for a while, actually, I think that probably these creatures are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. In fact, we know that they can send out a three-dimensional image, which is basically telepathic communication. So what if it was done on purpose? And I look a little bit farther, and what do I see? In 1838, Charles Bonnycastle performed the first known echo sounding experiments. In 1859, Lieutenant Matthew Fontaine Murray, commander of the U.S. Navy Depot of Charts and Instruments, attempted unsuccessfully to use sound to measure the depth of the ocean. These experiments failed. Not because the idea was wrong, but because Lieutenant Murray did not use an underwater receiver to listen for the echo. I don't know. Was he really that stupid? Or maybe did he do it on purpose because he knew that it would damage them? I don't know. Like I said, it's just speculation. All right, guys, this is Diana from DivineFactal.com. And until next time, be fearless, fill your heart with love, and create art. Love you guys.